Glenn Mark Kleiman. Hello, Glenn Mary. This is the Glenn Show, Mark, and I'm so happy to be welcoming you back on for us to have our verbal combat over matters political and uh, policy related. Always a pleasure. Mark Kleiman. But I spent I spent two University days up with these things getting of my California, game face Los off. Pardon me, Mark. Yeah. I was trying to introduce you, and I I forgot the institution. So perhaps you should just say it yourself. Uh, UCLA. Uh, that's UCLA, but are you? St oh, you're going to Virginia in the fall. I'll be in, be in Virginia in the fall, and also visiting at the National Institute of Justice. So I'm a, a man okay. of many hats. You're going to be on the East Coast again next year. Correct. Right? That's exciting. Correct. You're well, back I, in LA at the moment. I'm back in LA at the at the moment, but I, I discovered spending last fall and winter in Washington. They're trying to do national policy from Los Angeles is like they're trying to do filmmaking from Washington. Yeah. You're just sort of in the wrong place. I see. And you're doing national policy, are you? I'm uh, doing my best. Okay, so what are we talking about today, Mark? Um, so we're talking about is. the election. And ah, yes, the election. What the role of us pointy-headed ivory tower types is when it comes to election time. What do you think that is? Well, um... To vote for Obama, I would guess. To vote for Obama, to encourage other people to vote for Obama and to arrest the Democratic ticket uh, now that the, the political system is hyper-partisanized. Um, and to call him as we see him, yes. Um, as far as you know, truth and falsity is, um, but not to go out of our way to make false moral equivalents. Not to go out of our way to make false moral equivalents. Right. Um, okay. And um, uh, what would I mean? It sounds like you're saying pick a side and fight for it. Yeah, pick a side and fight for it, and. Be prepared, you know, since we are, after all, supposed to be intellectuals and truth-tellers, be prepared to call foul on your side when a foul is committed. Do I have to have a side, Mark? Can I not just stay above the fray? Um, can I just be an intellectual who's observing what's happening? Do I have to be a partisan? You can. Uh, you'll remember that uh, Dante will reserve the lowest circle of hell <laughs> for the neutrals. Um, look, the other side, um, the billionaires and their friends, uh, have pulled out all the stops. Right? They don't have any doubt about the stakes in this election. Right? With demographic change happening the way it is, um, the current business model of the Republican Party is broken. Um, but if they can seize the machinery of government now uh, and use that to further change the campaign finance system to favor themselves, and further change the voting system to disfavor uh, people who might vote Democratic, um, and uh, abolish trade unions and uh, tort lawyers, who are the among the main sources of money for the Democratic Party, um, they may be able to seize semi-permanent control, which was Karl Rove's announced goal under George W. Bush, which was somewhat messed up by the stubbornness in Iraq and by George W. Bush, but it's not as if those folks have changed their goal. Um, and uh, well, they want to win. I mean, I don't see how that's anything new in politics. Of course, they want to construct a durable majority. But when I go down this list of this bill of particulars, you know, campaign finance. I, as I recall, it was a Democrat running for president in 2008 who took his campaign finance outside of the system of federal support uh, so that he would be able to spend unlimited sums that he could raise and uh, outspend his opponent by some considerable margin. And I remember some commentary at the time that President Obama's decision not to take uh, uh, federal uh, 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 funds for uh, finance, uh, campaign finance support was going to blow up the system of regulating money. Now, I'm not saying he's responsible for Citizens United. I understand that the Supreme Court made a decision that opened the way for corporate money to come into political campaigns, but I am saying that the President himself has some responsibility, doesn't he, for uh, creating a political uh, environment in which money uh, is uh, playing a bigger role than it might have played in presidential politics. Did, do I get that wrong? I, th I think you probably do. I doubt Citizens United would have come, come down any differently. Um, or yeah, but, but shouldn't he have taken the public money in 2008? And, and isn't he uh, in a somewhat compromised position to be complaining about money in politics when uh, uh, he acted the way he did in 2008? Maybe. Uh, okay. I, 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 look, it seems to me you're alighting 
two different notions. One is that people in politics play to win. Yep. Uh, and the other is that some people in politics play to win permanently by being willing to change the rules when they're in power to prevent an honest contest that might put them out of power. Those aren't the same thing. Um, and it seems to me that the combination of Bush v. Gore, um, the transformation of the filibuster from an extraordinary measure uh, to simply a 60-vote majority in the Senate, right? That happened in 2009. That didn't happen before. Uh, Citizens United, um, and then all these these uh, voter suppression uh, measures at the state level. Um, they're all pointing, uh, as the Declaration of Independence says, in the same direction. Uh, and so when one party is prepared to cheat in unlimited ways to establish semi-permanent power, no, it doesn't seem to me that a good citizen ought to be neutral about that. Oh, gee, Mark, you're talking like a coup d'etat language. You're saying the Republicans are trying to take over the state. They're trying to rig elections. They're trying to buy elections. They're trying to keep people from voting. Yes. That sounds hysterical to me. Well, no, no, but, but the question is not whether it sounds hysterical to you, but whether it's true. Whether it's true. No, I... <laughs> sounds hysterical I mean, yes, it because is. it seems so far at variance with what I take to be the true character of the situation, which is that well, let's, let's, politics let's go back is a to, rough and tumble game. Let's, but let him, let, just let me finish this. It's a rough and tumble game in Illinois. It's a rough and tumble game in the city of Chicago. Uh, the uh, President of the United States march to his exalted position was paved by a number of political moves that I suppose could be characterized by a partisan as rigging or uh, structuring the game in such a way as to favor his election or whatever, whether it's getting your opponent disqualified because of some technicality in the ballot process. Not some technicality in the ballot process. Changing opponent, the character opponent, of your district. Opponent, opponent, so the ahead, stop, step back. Okay. His opponent had filed a bunch of phony petitions. And Obama okay, went through okay, and okay. checked the signatures. Okay, I would draw, I would draw, Mark, and I'm not even going to mention the redistricting issue where you try to change the demographic character of your, uh, of your district. So it's different. that wouldn't be voter suppression by any chance, would it? No, uh, you know. actually, it would. It would be redistricting. That's that's you know, it's an old tradition. Redistricting, which in every state that I know about, every ten years, gets down to a political contest sure between does. partisan parties who try to draw the lines sure and break the rules in favor of their own electorate, Democrat and Republican alike. Nothing new in that. No, no, right. But that's 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 part of the established rules of the game. Bush v. Gore, where a five to four majority in the Supreme Court chooses the President of the United States and happens to choose the one that those five people voted for. That wasn't the old rules of the game. Citizen United wasn't the old rules of the game. Um, no. I know that there are Supreme Court decisions that you don't like, Mark. I might not like them either, but they don't add up to a conspiracy by Republicans to c take control of the state. They're not a... No, no, no. I'm just, I'm not, I, didn't, I didn't say conspiracy. That was your, your word. What I said was... Sorry. ...that a set of... Look, we have... You know, it's, it said that we're different from, from the UK because we have a written constitution and they have an unwritten constitution. Yeah. But, of course, that's false. Yes, we have a written constitution, and we have a very large number of unwritten agreements about the way the game is played. And what's distinctive about this Republican Party is their willingness to change all of those unwritten rules whenever they favor their, their goals. So you, yeah. had, you had under... under I mean, under Democrats way, wouldn't me, do anything finish, like that. This. I mean, let me finish Republicans this. and Democrats are really characterologically different. Republicans are nasty people who try to rig the rules, and Democrats just... They just go ahead and play by all the implicit understandings. They don't matter where the chips fall. They're just nice guys. Come on. No, no, wait, wait. Let me, let me, let me, let me let this talk facts for a moment. Okay, so the filibuster rule in the Senate goes way back. Yep. Uh, Democrats were using it to block certain thoroughly obnoxious uh, appeals court appointees under uh, King Bush II. So, well. <laughs> so, so the Republicans decided that that suddenly decided that filibustering judicial nominees was unconstitutional and proposed what they called for a while the nuclear option, um, basically changing the Senate rules in the middle of the session, which you're actually not allowed to do, uh, to abolish the filibuster for those, for those purposes. So there arose the Gang of 14 alleged moderates that worked out a treaty that meant that all of Bush's appeals court nominees got confirmed. Um, and basically that compromise said, no, we, we won't filibuster ju judicial nominees except under extraordinary circumstances. All right, fast forward to the election of 2008. Democrats take the presidency and the Senate. 
And suddenly, every single Democratic proposal is automatically filibustered twice. First a filibuster on the motion to proceed to business, and then a filibuster on the bill itself. Including, sour of course, grapes. judicial nominees. All I have to say to that is sour grapes. Elect some more senators. That, I mean, all I have to say to it is the rules will be used by partisan parties to achieve their no, objectives. No, no, but I see nothing. I see nothing distinctively evil about the contemporary Republican Party. If you had better policy arguments, you'd muster majorities behind what you were trying to do, and you no, no, get no, the no, thing done. And if you had more effective Glenn. political leadership, I'm just finishing my sentence. If you had more effective political leadership, you'd be able to create those majorities. So this is just sour grapes. Okay, I'm done. Glenn, we had a majority. We had briefly 60 votes in the Senate, right? I mean, that was held up by that nonsense in Minnesota, which was a little bit beyond the ordinary run of politics. Um, but we had a, a and vast majority. And that was in Massachusetts, too. We had a vast though. majority. We had a much bigger majority at the presidential level and in Congress than the Republicans had after the 2000 election, right? After the 2000 election, you might have expected the Republicans to say, well, look, you know, we only sort of barely took this thing. We ought to be a little bit willing to compromise. In fact, they pushed through the, the tax giveaway to their rich friends. Um, oh, please, Mark, come on, we're both serious intellectuals. Yeah. We don't have to talk in soundbite talks. They pushed through for their rich friends. I mean, please. Well, what, what, what was it? What was it? It was a huge tax break to the country it turns out couldn't afford. Um, Most of the money is going to the middle class. No. Most of the action in the tax reform debate is at the middle class. No, that's actually not right. Well, the the... Tax policy experts that I listen to tell me, including uh, Peter Orzag, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. that the debate about whether or not to raise taxes for the rich is an important political debate that the president wants to raise taxes and mm -hmm. the Republicans don't want to raise it for, quote, their rich friends, close quote. But that the solution uh, to the country's long-term fiscal uh, budgetary problems lies in whether or not you extend those tax cuts for the middle class. If you were going to balance the budget or get the country on the right uh, financial footing, you'd want to think about not extending those tax cuts, period. Okay. So the idea that for people with incomes over $250,000 we're going to raise their taxes is not the solution to our problem in the long term. That's my understanding of the situation. It's certainly true that there were tax cuts in the 2001 bill for people under 250 and that certain solutions to the long-term fiscal problem would involve going back on that. But it's not as if the Republicans are willing to go back on those either, right? I mean, the, so the no, current they don't debate, want to raise anybody's taxes in a recession right. is their line. They're, but they don't want to raise anybody's taxes. Look, they've all signed this Grover Norquist pledge never to raise anybody's taxes ever. Government's too big. Again, that's their line. The, the government's too big. That's their line. Not, of course, to any of the parts of the government they care about. So the president's also criticized for cutting back on the defense budget, which, in fact, he hasn't. I mean, why, why are you trying to defend these people? Okay. Yes, sir. Huh? I'm sorry. I, I, I was talking and therefore didn't hear what right. you said. I apologize. So, so the Republicans want to cut back on the size of the government except for defense, Social Security, and Medicare. Right? So the president's atta attacked for the pieces of the health care <coughs> reform that limited Medicare Advantage. Right? I mean... I, I don't think you can legitimately construct a moral or intellectual equivalency between the Democrats and the Republicans on the issue of fiscal responsibility. But my point was not, I, I not about the substance. <laughs> my point was not about the yeah, substance. Right. My point was about the way in which the Republicans and the Democrats conceived what was legitimate in the use of the power that the voters had temporarily given them. The Democrats thought that they ought to compromise with the Republicans in 2009 after an overwhelming victory. And the Republicans thought that they should use their power in 2001 after a squeaker to push through absolutely everything they could put their hands on. And part of the difference is that the Democrats, like the Republicans, are heavily dependent on campaign finance from rich people. Right? The, the, the disproportion in who gives political money has seriously challenged the democratic legitimacy of our political process. And yes, because of the fact that, that we left the elected. That was small d democratic, huh? right. I said that was small d democratic legitimacy. Small d democratic legitimacy, and yeah, as much of a problem for the Democrats as the I'm inclined to agree with you that there's too much money in politics. I don't see that as a Republican uh, thing that's being done to the country. I, I think there's too much money in politics. I agree with you. Maybe we need a constitutional convention because the Supreme Court is interpreting the First Amendment in the way that it's interpreting it. 
And uh, well, that's remember, probably not going to change for a very long time, right? That Citizens United was not a nonpartisan thing. That was the partisan Republicans on the Supreme Court. Doing okay, 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 okay. I want to talk about something else. Can I? Yeah, please. Okay. Voter suppression. Right. So we've been around on this before, and I just want to reiterate my position, which is I see nothing wrong with asking people to produce IDs when they vote. Okay? It may or may not be good policy, but it's not evil policy. We can argue around the details of whether the costs and benefits outweigh each other, but I don't see anything wrong. Yeah. Neither do I see I that some can. plot is some plot. You know, I mean, let, let me just finish this, yeah. because the Voting Rights Act is going to be uh, a, a subject of debate going forward, the continuation of the Voting mm -hmm. Rights Act. And this whole regime that we've been in since 1965 of... Uh, trying to ensure equal access to the ballot box for people based upon race and ethnicity in the face of a history of voter suppression, we're 50 years beyond that now. And this language that every time somebody changes a rule or that affects voting that might be calculated to adversely impact uh, the Democratic Party, then they're engaging in some kind of uh, evil civil rights undermining, racistly motivated uh, uh, impediment uh, to democracy is, is just an anachronism. It no longer actually characterizes what's going on, it seems to me. So, you know, uh, I, I, I just uh, hold my wallet when I hear you guys uh, uh, shrieking about how the Republicans are trying to keep people from voting. There's an election. Right, well, Everybody wants to turn out their base. That's all. And, and you know, whatever. No, okay. No, 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 no. no but there's a big difference between wanting to turn out your base and you're trying to prevent the other guy's base from voting. Right? The Democrats, right, the absentee voters, tend to be upper income and therefore tend to be Republican. I am not aware of any, and there's lots of absentee voter fraud. Right? It's very easy to vote two places if you have an absentee voting. Um, you know, it's not a big problem for the political system, but the, the fraud certainly exists. And Democrats could certainly do themselves a favor by disenfranchising Republicans who can't be home on Election Day because they're out on their business trip. They wouldn't be doing themselves a favor. If they came out against absentee voting, somebody would point out that that's the way military officers participate in right. so you could when they're deployed abroad, and they would get slammed right. at the so polls. And that's the reason they're not doing it, Mark. The reason they're not doing it is not because they're more virtuous than anybody else. They've made the calculation and figured out it's not a winner for them. You could the certainly Democrats will do anything you could to get elected. I mean, let, again, let, let me, let me. Okay, okay. You could certainly allow absentee votes for military only, right? I mean, not, not complicated there. Um, but in fact, <clears throat> we've had nationwide in Republican states only, right? No state with a Democratic majority has decided this was a good idea. Republican states only have decided that what's a good idea? I'm sorry. Uh, requiring a, a not just an ID, a state issued vo photo ID to vote on Election Day. Right? This will, in fact, disenfranchise people who have been voting for decades. Lots of elderly people. Disenfranchise? Well, lots of elderly people. It will not disenfranchise them. Mark, come on, will you just watch your language? No, no. All we're asking you to do is go over to the RMV, stand in line for 30 minutes, and get the ID. Well. That's not disenfranchisement. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. It is not disenfranchising. Right, so I'm glad it turns out to be a little bit more complicated than that, in fact. So, I don't know about where you live. Where I live, a trip to the DMV is not a 30-minute exercise, even if there happens to be a DMV office convenient to you. Of course, if you don't have a driver's license, that means you don't drive. Most DMV offices are not actually accessible by, by public transit. So it's not clear, not clear how people are supposed to get to the DMV. When they get to the DMV, they will be charged $35 or $50. Sounds to me a lot like a poll tax, right? That's not Let the Service Employees International Union hire some buses to take them to the DMV. I'm sure that they've got the funds set aside for it. Well, and in fact, a lot of... Well, it's be, not disenfranchisement. It's, 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 no, wait, wait a second, wait a second. Wait a second. And, and, and the SEIU is also supposed to pay the 50 bucks, Right? People are being charged for the right to vote. People who've been voting for years are being required to get a document that the state charges for. And in lots of states, in order to get your driver's license, you have to produce your birth certificate. Now, look, you and I both have a birth certificate available because, you know, we have passports and we have to have it to get a passport. Some guy living in Philadelphia who was born in Alabama is going to have a hard time getting his birth certificate when Alabama won't give you your birth certificate without a driver's license. 
to prove okay. that you're you. I, I don't know the empirical magnitude of the problems that you're talking about. And if I could be persuaded that they were sufficiently large, I myself personally might think it's not a good idea to put this particular requirement on a voter. I'm not certain about 20% that. But what I'm of certain of, what I'm certain of do is not that have this a valid photo ID. What I'm certain laws. of, Mark, is that this policy debate doesn't involve suppression or uh, disenfranchisement of people's rights There's, to vote. The, it involves setting the parameters that govern voting, which are more or less disadvantageous to different people depending upon their situation, and about which rational arguments can be made to either side. Well, so Pen so, Pen Pennsylvania, the, the Pennsylvania is being sued about its new, new law, which will disenfranchise more people than Obama's margin in Pennsylvania in 2008, and where the Republican leader of the Pennsylvania legislature boasted to a Republican gathering that the voter ID would allow Mitt Romney to carry the state. And they stipulated at the very beginning of the case that they had no evidence of any voter impersonation fraud, which is what this thing is supposed to combat. So you can't really do a benefit cost analysis on a program that has no benefits that you're prepared to stand up and speak for. Well, then why was the program enacted? Evidently, In order did, to disenfranchise to black people. people. <sighs> okay. No, look, there's no I, I, I give up, my man. I give up. I give up. Let's talk about something else. We disagree about voter suppression. I want to talk about unions. Um, last week, I was watching the Diane Ream, listening to the Diane mm -hmm. Ream show, the radio interview show. They were talking about the Postal Service. Mm -hmm. U.S. Postal Service mm -hmm. is on hard times right. uh, periodically, blah, blah, this and that. Uh, uh, notice, Austin by the way, it's on, hard, it's on hard times because Congress passed a law requiring them to be fully current with their pension Mark, program. Can we please not get down into the weeds? And no, no, no. no, make no my point? I just want to, want to notice that, that, that no private company That is not the only reason why the Postal Service is on hard times. The Postal Service is on hard times because of something called email. Okay? I mean, they're on hard times because of something called the Federal Express. Uh, it, the, 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 the postal the service would be solvent. The cost structure of the postal yes. service relative to the competitors uh, puts them in a very difficult position. They've True. got hundreds of thousands of employees. They've and got they millions of dollars of pension commitments. And if I could just make my yeah. point, my point was that on this show, I heard a union guy defending the status quo, and I heard a, a right wing free marketeer from the Cato Institute attacking it. And to my, and I consider myself to be a relatively liberal Democrat on social policy issues, here, the union guy was, was a, a self-justifying, uh, um, uh, 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 full of just rhetoric and slogans. Uh, and the guy who was saying privatize, modernize, uh, divest, uh, allow competition to come in, adapt to the future, mm -hmm. it's not about maximizing your employee's benefit, had all the points in the debate. And the point I'm wanting to make here, just more generally, is that the unions, as an anchor of the Democratic Party, are not attractive institutions going forward in the 21st century to many people, like myself, who regard ourselves as relatively progressive, but who also know what time of day it is and understand how these institutions are working. So, so I'm, one reason that I am not signing up for the slogan, flag-waving, uh, uh, you know, cliche spouting uh, pro Obama uh, 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 salvation effort this time around is that I, I look at the party, I look at Harry Reid, I look at Nancy Pelosi, I look at the congressional Democrats, I look at the union base of the party, I look at these various interest groups that the president is pandering to on the left and the right, and I'm intellectually uh, uh, well discussed is the word that comes to mind. It may be a little bit stronger than what okay, I wanted so, before. So I can't love them. I can tell you this, I cannot love them. Okay, I said my piece. So, 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 so let's, let's, let's do, first off, why am I unsurprised that uh, Cato was able to hire an economist who makes a speech that's more attractive to an economist than some labor union leader can make in response? I mean, that just doesn't seem to me like a particularly fair test. Oh, come on. No, I mean, but, because I'm an economist? I mean, I'm just saying the arguments made more sense. Yeah, I'm I mean, sure maybe they they're right. I'm sure they maybe the reason is that economists maker. know something. You had a professional argument maker against a union organizer. I'm not surprised a that a professional organizer did a, did a good job. Who nothing but slogans. Okay, but anyway, we can explain it on the basis of the personalities or the skills of the particular people. But you're saying there is nothing uh, to my point that the unions are on the wrong side of history about a lot of this stuff? 
trying to hold on to a mid 20th century model of how to protect their people when uh, the 21st century requires something very different? Well, when the global marketplace requires something very different? Well, it's entirely possible that some reforms are needed. My point only is that if you destroy every social organization except the corporation, right? You destroy state and local government, you destroy, destroy the federal government, you destroy the unions, what the hell's left? I mean, politics does need a social basis. And nobody seems to blame the Republicans for pandering to their base. That seems to be fine. Because um, that seems, you know, all good 21st century. Um, no, I'm not prepared to split the coalition until the coalition is solidly in power. Um, uh, you're, you, for some reason, you seem to think it's perfectly appropriate to ask your side to commit political suicide. I'm trying to figure out what's what's the motivation. No, no, no. What I'm explaining is why I don't really have a side. That's what I'm explaining. So, I mean, so I'm, you don't, I'm, I'm trying to get back to this question. So you don't have you know, a side. You don't have a side between yeah. people who deny global warming and people who want to do something about it. You don't have a uh, side. Mark, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Right? Global warming. Yep. Okay. Okay. Now, um, in my mind, uh, the question of whether or not one is a denier mm -hmm. is the progressive and partisan democratic way of framing what is an excruciatingly difficult policy problem, which is how much cost and in what way should we incur the cost mm -hmm. to deal with the implications of these uh, very large uh, climactic uh, developments that are ongoing. Mm -hmm. One aspect of which, and only one aspect of which, is the role of human activity in uh, uh, facilitating uh, the warming of the earth. It's only one aspect of the larger problem. And the policy problem is enormously hard in a global community of nations where there are no central institutions mm -hmm. to make any kind of decisions and so forth. It's not at all obvious what to do. Okay? So well, a lot is, of people... Is it obvious that let me, something let me, should be done? Let me, let me just state my position here. Yeah. A lot of people are saying, as you get ready to want me to spend $500 billion or whatever it is on this or that scheme, whoa, wait a minute. I'm not sure that that's a good idea, okay? I'm not sure that the circumstance that we're in, which is the climate is changing and there's some human activity that's influencing it, so I'm not a denier in that respect, warrants the large-scale intervention that you are, are, are promulgating, to which often the response is, ah, oh, you're a denier and you don't believe in global warming and you're an idiot. Uh, the Democrats are not going to win many elections by calling the people of West Virginia who want to keep their coal industry and who don't like the environmental activists idiots who are deniers of global warming. I don't really think so, that's the so, issue. But so you're, willing to ask, you're willing to ask all of the labor union members in the country to adjust the 21st century, but not the coal industry. Okay. I'm not sure, I'm not sure why, but <laughs> no, no, okay. no, 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 no. What I said, what I said, I didn't say that I was against. And in fact, let me just say, I am for a kind of cap and trade scheme that would raise the price of carbon mm -hmm. everywhere that carbon is being used in such a way that market forces could induce people right. to economize, weatherize, uh, right. uh, switch over to uh, uh, renewable fuels, and so forth and so on. There's we're, we're an, yeah, this is a classic externality tax. problem. Burning the fuel creates costs right. that are not borne by the people who burn it. You raise the cost of the fuel. Right. So I'm for that. And the people of West Virginia would not elect me to anything. What Correct. I'm against is calling them stupid idiots who don't uh, understand modern science because they object to this or that scheme that they regard no, as hurting no, no, their no. interest. I, I, I might be on the other side from them, but I still wouldn't, uh, you know. I, did, I, did, I didn't call West Virginia <laughs> anything. Now, you raised that. I pointed out that it is an article of faith in today's Republican Party that there is no anthropogenic warm, global warming, that it's a fraud, that it's a hoax. No, I, I don't, I disagree with that characterization. Well, that, I'm, I'm simply quoting a couple of Republican senators. And Mitt Romney has never said, yes, of, close, of course global warming is a problem. Now we have to figure out what to do about it. What, what we he is have solidly here, with the deniers. What, what we have here, I think, is not a different <laughs> denier. This is a little bit like a birther, right? I mean, this is, a, you know, the, the demonization of the opponent by suggesting... I'm, 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 I'm really quoting them. I mean, I mean what, the word what we hoax have here has been used on the floor of the U.S. Senate. Two different belief systems that are in conflict, but they're not belief systems about the legitimacy of science. They're belief systems about the, the perfectibility, the role of government institutions, the extent to which public activism is, uh, uh, can be relied upon to produce good outcomes that outweigh the unintended right. consequences and so forth. Sorry. And, and uh, let, let me just say this, Mark, okay? Um, uh, 
the, the global warming, therefore we have to do X movement can itself be a uh, non-rational kind of religious kind of, it's, it's not just science, it's, it's a, uh, a belief in a certain kind of uh, possibility of a precise intervention to, to cause it, you know, a benefit that, you know, uh, it, so the, I, I think there are two sides to the argument. There are not two sides to the argument about the science, but there are two sides to the argument about the policy. Well, there's other, there's, there's, there's lots of sides there. to the argument about, about the policy, and I think yeah. we're way under investing in the possibility of geoengineering. But my point is that a particular view about the science, that it's a hoax, is now an official dogma of the Republican Party. Official dogma of the Republican Party. Take a look at the documents. Um, take a look. That at wasn't my impression before coming to this conversation. Well, um, I would like to just, I mean, you know, when, a, when a U.S. senator gets up and denounces all the climate scientists in the world as participants in a hoax, you'd think that somebody else might want to comment on that. But so far, nobody's doing that. And, you know, if Romney believes that global warming is an actual problem, it would be nice to hear him say so. He hasn't. As for anything to do about it, the straightforward th thing to do. That's You've heard of code words, have you? Uh huh. Yeah. Have you Have you heard about how arguments about some issues can really be displaced discussions about other issues? And yes. Are you aware of the fact that elements of an unwieldy coalition may be more or less satisfied to hear their uh, opponents talking in uh, these or those code words because they associate them with positions with which they strongly disagree? Uh, perhaps this has come up in the area of race and. Uh, uh, inequality in American society, where, for example, calling attention to the existence of states' rights guaranteed by the United States Constitution right. is understood to be an unspeakable uh, nod toward et cetera, et cetera. Right, which of course it so, was. Part, yeah, well, uh, and so that's why many Democrats wouldn't have said it, even if they believed the states' rights. Right? And many Republicans are not going to go out of their way to say what they might believe if it's going to alienate their base. That doesn't mm -hmm. make them idiots. I didn't it's say it's not idiots. anything new. No, no. I, look, Glenn, you keep using No, the but word you idiot. said we've got one party that's rational and that believes in science and that believes in the future yeah. and that cares about people and as respects the Constitution. And we've got another party that's trying to subvert the basic foundation of the Republic and uh, uh, turn uh, uh, the making of policy over to uh, fundamentalists. Okay. I mean, that's what I thought was your well, no, and I'm objecting I to that. I, did, I, did, I, I didn't raise the fundamentalist. That was, that was your thing, <laughs> though I'd be happy to do that. Um, <laughs> no, I don't believe for a second that, 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 that Mitt Romney doesn't believe in global warming. He's no fool. Um, but yes, he's part of a coalition right. that doesn't want to admit it. And by the way, the two rational things to do about it, I think you and I agree, are either a carbon tax, which is the most straightforward version, right? Just cover the external cost. And, you know, if you're rational, you'd want to phase that in slowly, which you can do. You know, decide the optimum level of the tax and phase it in over 15 years. The economy can easily adjust to that. That's the genius of capitalism. Um, or a cap and trade, which is a clumsier version of doing the same thing. Um, the cap and trade is, for some reason, is understood to be the Republican approach because taxes are evil. So the Obama administration, instead of saying, look, let's just do a carbon tax, and by the way, that would fix fix the country's long-term fiscal problem without raising anybody's income tax. Instead of doing that, they decided to compromise with a sort of AEI Heritage Foundation proposal, which was cap and trade, right? That's the standard uh, conservative environmental approach. And all the conservatives suddenly decided that that was tax and trade, and it was just a concealed tax increase. So absolutely like no Republican... the political incompetency of the uh, administration that was elected to power in 2008. No, no. I mean, you're going to blame the Republicans because they're obstructionists. I assume that's what this comes down to. They're against something that they were for before. Yep. And, and the, on uh, the and administration on the gets credit with not taking what would have actually been the correct policy view and what might have been actually more consistent with their ideolog ideological predilections, but trying to split the difference cleverly and ending up with egg on their face. And that's the Republicans' fault. Well, the voters have to decide whether they want to ratify the Republican decision in 2009 to obstruct absolutely everything that the president wanted simply because the president wanted, right? And they've been they, doing they, their best to tank the economy. They so, were in favor of deficit spending under Reagan and under Bush the second. And suddenly the deficit is our major national problem. I mean, you guys are really desperate. 
I mean, you've got it, it, here. It's going to sound like a Mitt Romney talking point, and I'm sorry, people, but this is this is the way I see it. You've got an administration which, for four years, has failed to accomplish a great many things and has presided over a horrible economy and has not distinguished itself. Okay, and the guy's running for re-election, and he's got an uphill fight with good reason. Okay. And, and so you regard healthcare as not accomplishing much? No, no. I said, well, I regard healthcare as having accomplished something. Okay, but on the whole, I regard the first administration as not having been particularly impressive. I know there's a counter argument to this. I have not been impressed by the president's conduct of the administration in the first year. I've not been impressed by the quality of national leadership that he's brought to bear. I've not been impressed by the campaign that he's running now. And so you are so the country to vote for him because the other guy is worse. Okay. I'm going to vote for him because the other guy is worse. But I'm just saying, I don't, you know, uh, uh, this is not the Republicans' fault that Barack Obama has been weak and relatively ineffective, in my opinion. Now, we can argue about it in the first term. I can't blame that on the Republicans. I have to blame that on the failure of the president to rise to the occasion. Well, or you could say that the president decided not to exploit his power to the max, to try to govern cooperatively, to try to unite the country, which is, after all, what he promised. And the Republicans decided that it was to their political advantage to rebuff that. And, you know, you can now go back and say, well, look, the president shouldn't have tried that. He should have known that it would fail. But if you're a voter, you have to decide whether you want to reward the party that tried to be cooperative, or reward the party and decided to be obstructionist to the very, very great cost of the American public. And your your attempt to squat in the middle of nowhere, holding hands with Philippe Bourdieu, and not be part of the political process, seems to me unconvincing. You know, I said I'm going to vote, okay? That's my no, no, participation but, but, in the process. I'm gonna, actually going to vote the way that you would favor. But, but in the meantime, you're doing all I am damage. not going to become a hack. I, with respect, I am not going to surrender my intellectual independence or my sense of critical, uh, my critical faculty. No, nobody asked you uh, to. Be, because there's an election coming on. And, so, and, so and, let's and, and, and this guy, who everybody was lighting up behind in 2008 mm -hmm. is the greatest thing since sliced bread, needs to be viewed with clear-eyed realism, in my opinion, whether or not that facilitates his re-election prospects. So, you know, that's where I am. So if, Me if, and Philippe were the late great. Wish that I could be in the class of Philippe Bourdieu. Bordeaux. I mean, you know, we're going to tell the truth until the last breath. Okay, but why is, of the why is it only the negative truth about Barack Obama you want to tell? There's no no negative truth to tell about the Republican Party. There's no negative truth to tell about Mitt Romney. That's because I'm talking to you, Mark. If I were talking to a, a Romney uh, partisan, I would be uh, probably 80, uh, 20 in the other direction. Okay, when have you done that? What I'm asking is, <laughs> other than casting your slip of paper, what are you doing to ha cast your whole vote for making this a better country? Okay. I mean, you've got a, you've got a Senate race going in Massachusetts. Yes, uh, yes, we do. We definitely have a Senate race going here. It's uh, Scott Brown versus Elizabeth Warren. Right. Is that yeah. one close in your mind? Um, you mean... The choice? The, the relative merits of the candidates. Well, I'll say this. Elizabeth Warren looks to me to be the sharper knife in the drawer relative to Scott Brown, and I don't just mean her IQ. Uh, and I am certainly more inclined toward her relatively liberal democratic uh, viewpoint on many issues, including on the issues of financial regulation. Uh, so I think it's highly likely that I would vote for uh, Elizabeth Warren in this election. That is, me personally would vote for Elizabeth Warren. And if the issue came up in the context of a blogging head discussion or whatever, I'm not sure I'd be able to find anything good to say about Scott Brown, other than that he's a relatively likable guy when viewed on the TV screen. Right. He, he, he does come off as a kind of you know, guy you wouldn't mind having a beer with. And Elizabeth Warren comes off, well, as a Harvard Law professor, which is what she is. Right. But uh, yes, I, 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 got, the first I need to, I need to protest the, the importance of beer in American politics. That's, <laughs> that's but, uh, you know, yeah, I, I see that. Uh, I mean, obviously it's important. Who controls the Senate is going to be important. I just right. see the Democrats, not the Republicans, in control of the Senate. I want to see Elizabeth Warren. So what am I doing to make the country a better place? So, you know, I'm trying to raise the level of debate above the mudslinging partisanship to the extent that I can make a small contribution to that. 
and and I'm trying to uh, you know deal with the truth and try to cut through the the crap. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's how I see myself. Now, to the extent I succeed, I don't know, but that's how I see myself. So, so there's a brilliant paper by a brilliant guy named Glenn Lowry on political correctness. And I know that paper. That's that's a, that's a fine paper. Thank you. And. Uh, and the analysis is very sharp. So, for those who haven't had the pleasure of reading it, what's what's the site, Glenn? So that's um, self censorship and public discourse: a theory of political correctness and related phenomena, and it's published in Rationality and Society, an academic journal, in 1994. My God, 18 years ago. All right. I've been teaching it ever since. Oh, bless you. Thank you. So, and the argument basically is: you'll, you'll you'll correct me if I don't get it right. Right. Uh, the argument basically is, um, when somebody speaks um, about some topic, the listeners are getting information about the topic, they're also getting information about the speaker. The speaker has a private interest in what the listeners think about him and only a diffuse public interest in changing their minds on the topic. And therefore it's natural, rational, for speakers to modify what they say from what they believe in order to make them see they make themselves look like good people to the audience. So they don't say the word states' rights because that might suggest that they were racist. You got it, Mark. That's a very good summary. And that distorts all of our political discourse. Yes. And indeed. it would be better if there were honest, brave people who were prepared to put the public interest over their private interest and say politically incorrect things. Um, so that's and, and I give many examples in history where right. uh, that kind of thing has happened. Exactly. Right. right. So that's the paper, and it's, you know, it's very convincing. I want to take it one more step, though. Mm. So now we've all read that paper. All of us who are, you know, in the in crowd, and we understand that people who say the things that the crowd wants them to hear are likely to be people of low integrity, and that people who say the things that the crowd wants them not to hear wants not to hear from them are likely to be people of higher integrity. And therefore we, the sophisticates, should judge people positively when they say things that are politically incorrect. <laughs> um, well, that simply reproduces the problem one level, one, one octave higher. So now if you want to show that you're a serious independent-minded intellectual like Glenn Lowry, and not a partisan hack like Mark Kleiman, <laughs> you should take every attack, uh, every Sorry. opportunity to attack Barack Obama in the moment of maximum national peril. Um, so you can stand stand tall in the faculty common room. Oh, well, first of all, very clever uh, uh, takeoff on the original argument. I mean, because we've now got a meta argument going on. We've got a we got an argument that says mindful of the fact that people are watching and that they know that pandering to base sentiment is commonplace. An individual has an incentive to stick out like a sore thumb and cut across the grain and say the things that are not usually said so that he will be understood to be brave, courageous, fearless, uh, uh, have integrity and so forth and so on. Which, of course, leads to just another kind of distortion, because right. it may not be, quote, the truth, close quote. We should, we should write the follow-up paper. That, that he's motivated to seek. It may, he may not be seeking the truth at all. He may just be seeking a kind of notoriety, or a, 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 he may be trying to cultivate a certain kind of brand, a brand for truth-telling that really leads to a kind of negation of, of the deeper truth. And the sin of pride is lurking here, whereas it was cowardice in my uh, narrative. You know, people afraid right. to step up and stand against McCarthyism or whatever it might be because they didn't want to be labeled a commie or whatever the story might be, and they didn't tell the truth as they saw it, so they were cowardly and we needed courage. Now it's the sin of pride. The person wants to be seen as the brave, and I, and I know this phenomenon that you're talking about in the, in the race discourse right. where the individual says what would appear to be the racist thing and then pokes their chest out by way of saying, you see, I'm not going to be cowed by all these PC exactly. people running around these campuses. Exactly. I'm prepared to point out that black crime, and this is not personal, Mark, is black right. crime created by black people, that they create too much of it, blah, 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 blah. I think of uh, my uh, uh, associate, Amy Wax, the law professor at the University of Pennsylvania, when I say this, and I don't mean her any ill will, but I just say that I think sometimes she's really taking pride in cutting against mm -hmm. me. She knows she's saying something that's going to make everybody sit up in their chair and stiffen 
and she just says it with relish because you know she's standing against the grain she has a kind of identity investment in it and you seem to be accusing me mark if i if i read you of having an identity investment see i'm the black guy at blogging heads or whatever one of the black guys i'm supposed to be for obama i'm a liberal democrat and blah 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 i'm supposed to be for obama so by not uh, mouthing the uh, sort of natural things that one would say in the heat of a partisan campaign on behalf of the president by not following the talking points of that day even if only you know unconsciously uh, by cutting against it by finding ways of criticizing Obama when people wouldn't expect me to do so you accuse me in a way of kind of a sin of pride of self promotion and you say I do it at the expense of the national um, good and I can only say a couple of things to that one is uh, you know gee you flatter me to think that what I do is that important one way or the other for the national good and the other is I want to plead not guilty uh, I want to say that my motive is not poking my chest out and asking people to look at me and showing myself to be brave by taking a contrarian position I want to say that I'm genuinely um, you know expressing what it is that I think about this and that I am less interested in the partisan political consequences of it than I am in trying to achieve a kind of clarity within my own mind of what it is that I think is going on. Uh, now, I'm not perfect, and I could be wrong about a lot of stuff, but I'm just telling you my motive is not one of trying to cultivate the contrarian uh, image. It's, it's one of genuinely being a contrarian, upset for the reasons that I've already said in this discussion about uh, what has happened under the president's watch in these first four years. Fair enough. Uh, I, I, I don't have a, a, a theological degree, so I'm not not uh, <laughs> professionally qualified to analyze uh, other people's sins. I got enough enough problem worrying about my own. All right, all right, all right. Um, but uh, yeah. but it does seem to me that that uh, moral equivalence uh, with respect to this particular presidential campaign is not legitimate. Um, you know, I think Harry Reid clearly crossed the line by you know basing a fairly stiff accusation on a, on an unnamed source. You're referring to Harry Reid having gone to the floor of the Senate and announced that he knew from somebody whom he wasn't willing to name that Mitt Romney hadn't paid taxes for 10 years, and that's why Romney wasn't uh, releasing his tax returns. Right. To now, which, I, yeah. I, I, I have taken the Glenn Lowry position on that. Right? Okay. Because so that I, sounds like McCarthyism to me. I mean, I don't yeah. know. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you know, if, if, if uh, Mr. Romney objects to McCarthyism, then, you know, you think you might want to defend Hume Abedin, who's being accused of disloyalty to, to the country because her father, dead 20 years, uh, was involved with an organization that was involved with the Muslim Brotherhood. But but putting aside, you know, his his standing to we object to any that. of that, um, I, I boldly said, you know, Harry Reid's Harry Reed's full of it. Now, I have to say that I did that, as far as I can tell, without any partisan sacrifice at all. Because any sentence that has the word Mitt Romney's taxes in it is good for Obama. <laughs> Um, still, you know, I, I do think that intellectuals have an obligation to call BS when their side is BSing. Um, Very good. Uh, but that does not involve, you know, a complete moral equivalence. Right? The first Romney ad in this campaign showed Barack Obama saying, if this election's about the economy, we lose. Right? That was the very first ad that Romney ran after he was the presumptive nominee. You remember this? Yeah. Uh, you remember the context? Um, I think he quoted Obama from the 2008 campaign, was uh -huh. it? Quoting Saying something, but it was taken out of context and given a meaning opposite of what it actually had been intended. Obama was quoting a McCain advisor. Yeah, that's what I think. As saying... <laughs> he <laughs> quoted <laughs> Obama quoting somebody, but then attributed it to Obama rather Correct. than to the person who Correct. Obama was quoting. That's, that's where this started. Right? Romney is genuinely postmodern in his complete <laughs> willingness to elide the difference between truth and falsehood. And his whole campaign has been based on it, up to this latest welfare stuff. Yeah. Right, where Obama has indicated the willingness to entertain proposals from the governors of Nevada and Utah right. for different ways of enforcing the work requirement work requirements under welfare the, uh, reform. And Romney is announcing that Barack Obama wants to make everybody in the country a lazy welfare Obama. Yeah, uh, Mark, I agree with you about that. Uh, I also didn't much like the Obama uh, campaign commercial that accuses Romney of having, in effect, caused the death of a guy's wife who died from cancer. 
All right. Well, let me let me let me take that one for a minute. For, for the minute. Yeah. I don't know the I don't know the facts of that case. Um, so whether you know it's it's true that she died of cancer because she didn't have health insurance and she didn't have health insurance. Well, what's been reported is that she had capital. her own health insurance with her own job. Her health insurance wasn't even coming through this guy's job. Okay. Well, my so understanding is she had it at one point and then she lost that other job too. Yeah, but I mean... So in any case... It, <clears> and, and the but, link between well, what's, what's Romney and, and this guy losing his job, the company probably lasted longer because Bank Capital came in and it did eventually close down, but he might have lost his job years before without the bank takeover. So the fact that the claim that they caused him to lose his job is also questionable. But the, but the general idea that you're going to accuse somebody of murder... Well, I mean, no, of, I don't of think killing? The word, I don't think the word uh, murder was used. Because you disagree on a policy? Uh, I, I don't yeah. think the word, the word murder was used. Okay. No. Killing, but causing well, the no, death I don't of. Think, I don't think I was Causing the it. death of. Being well, so, so here's death. the thing. Here's the thing. The, the, the private equity business is about rationalizing, is about, you know, adapting to the 21st century. Yep. And that involves firing people. It does, because and it's necessary to do that in order to have yeah, the economy okay. function. Fine. And under the... Healthcare system that Romney supports that he did in Massachusetts, right? So, so his campaign's response to the ad was, "Well, if this guy had been in Massachusetts, his yeah. wife would have been covered." But okay. on a national basis, Romney supports the system where you have health insurance only if you have a job. And under that system, firing somebody means depriving them of health insurance and depriving okay, them of health insurance. I'm, I'm not going to go searching for uh, so death, died. death panel equivalents of, uh, you know, attack on the... Uh, right, but, no, but, but Glenn, the death panel panels were entirely fictitious. This is, whether this particular woman died as a result of being laid off I and losing her health insurance... I don't see any <clears throat> way around it. Well, no, it's... And it's the other no, no, kind it's really of just, campaigning. It's, I mean, mere, it's, it's merely the reduction to the personal of something that you and I both know exists as a phenomenon. Somebody surely died as a result of losing health insurance for being laid off from the If airport. I take a sign down from the highway, somebody's going to die. If I raise right. the speed limit from 55 you know, to 65, when Ronald somebody's going to die. When and if I favor gun, uh, 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 liberal gun policy, somebody is going to die. I, you know, Jesus. Right. Well, look, when, when Reagan did this, he was the great communicator. Right? It turns out that ordinary voters, particularly low information swing voters, make their decisions on anecdotes, not data. So if you want to raise an issue, you have to raise it in personal form. Um, it seems well, to me the underlying policy argument in that ad is completely solid. Um, it's an act of desperation by, you know, a campaign that can't point to the record and has to look to demonize the other guy. And it's ugly. I mean, that's just where I'm coming out. But why don't we agree to disagree yet again, Mark? And why don't we call it a day we've been talking for right. 15 as long minutes? As, as long as you agree to, to run, a, run a fundraiser for Elizabeth Warren. That, uh, how, how about that as the base of the treaty? I'm going to take that under advice. All right. <laughs> that is always a pleasure. Hope to see you in person soon. So do I. Thanks for the conversation. Take care.